Hello and welcome. So today we are carrying on with labour market and specifically we're going to be looking at labour market failure. So labour market failure is slightly different to, well it's not different but it's slightly more complex than normal kind of market failure. So it is when the market fails, the free market fails to allocate labour resources efficiently. Now remember when we're looking at market failure, we're taking into account kind of the wider economy and we are looking at whether or not resources are being allocated efficiently by the free market for everybody in a society or everyone in an economy. So it is when labour is not allocated efficiently by the free market and we'll look at some reasons why or how that might happen, but it might be useful for you to kind of think about it where labour is unable to be allocated efficiently. So it might be kind of useful for you to think a little bit about why labour is not able to enter markets or why supply is not able to be kind of given to a certain area. So think about, kind of pause the video and think about all the reasons why we might have labour market failure and think about what impacts that might have and as we go through this it might be really useful for you to start to think about what government intervention might be put in place or is already in place to kind of help correct some of this market failure. So the first thing that we're going to have a look at is a skills gap. So we would like to live in a world where our labour is transferable, right? Remember that labour is a factor of production. So ideally we're going to live in a society or an economy where your factors of production are completely transferable. And then obviously you're in your LRAS classical um, kind of model. But that doesn't always happen, right? Because we do not have transferable labour because there is a skills gap. And sometimes labour doesn't have the training to be able to transfer from one job to another. If we need more resources to be, more labour resources to put in a certain area of the economy, that labour may not have the correct skills to be able to transfer or switch. And there are several reasons for that. One of the reasons might be because a firm or a business is not going to put in enough of their own resources to train staff. And the main reason and the main kind of issue that happens is because of the free rider problem. So if you think about it kind of like if you're a business or if you're a firm and you have a lot of labour and they're currently doing what you need to do, what they need to do and they're relatively productive and you know that there is a risk, right? There is a risk that if you train that labour to be more transferable, to be higher kind of productivity in its, in its ability to be able to work in lots of different areas, then you're also increasing your risk of your labour leaving and another firm benefiting from your investment into that labour. And there lies the free rider problem. Why train your staff when you can benefit from other people or other firms training their staff. So actually, there's kind of a disincentive for firms to train staff. And that means that we have less transferable labour, which can create problems for the whole wider economy because it means that when we need that labour to be transferable for the good of society, the market has failed because it's not able to be able to do that. And equally, as you've seen in macro, that can be the cause of a lot of um, occupational, kind of structural um, unemployment. So individuals or entire areas may suffer from structural unemployment because there is a huge skills gap and there's likely to be a huge skills gap if you have a reliance on one particular industry in an area where there is much kind of even less of an incentive for firms to train their staff to be able to be transferable. So the idea of a skills gap means that there is a huge impact on our overall labour productivity because labour isn't able to move and switch between different markets or different industries and that can affect our overall wider growth of an economy because it means that we have individuals who are not able to maximise their productivity across different industries, they're stuck within one industry. 
So it can have a huge impact on our productivity and our overall macroeconomic growth. Let's move on to our next one. So our next one is geographical immobility of labour. But what we mean by that is individual human capital units aren't able to transfer to different industries because they're bound by their geographical location. So if you kind of think of that as I live in London, the perfect job might come up in Scotland that I would be able to be more productive in and kind of a, a much more impactful unit of human labour, but I'm bound to London, so I'm not going to be able to transfer to that industry or to that job. And there are lots of reasons for kind of being bound to a certain area. One of them is obviously family ties. As human beings, we are social human beings and we have huge amounts of family ties. If a job comes up that it means that you have to move away from your family, lots of individuals are just not willing or able to be able to enter that market. Family ties kind of act as a barrier to entry to some industries or some jobs because you're not able to move from a certain area. Equally, if you think about globally, if we have a shortage in our own economy, Obviously, perfectly, it'd be amazing if we could just kind of import some human capital to be able to help us to kind of fill, to, to kind of stop that market failure. However, we have regulation on um, kind of entry and exit and the mobility of human capital across the globe. And there are certain visa restrictions that act as barriers to entry and exit of certain markets. And then we've got infrastructure um, and kind of cost and access. So by that, I mean, if you live in some certain areas, if you don't have good access to public transport, if you don't have good access to road networks, if you don't have any kind of like main roads, so the idea of doing a journey is much, much longer because you're kind of driving on B roads or A roads, then you aren't going to be able to take certain jobs or enter certain industries because your opportunity cost is higher because you have to get physically to work. And the longer that takes, the idea of transferring, kind of getting from my house to wherever you decide to work, then obviously that is taking away from your leisure time and you're not be earning your income from that aspect of your time as well. So the opportunity cost is even higher. So unless you're going to be compensated, and we'll have a look at what that kind of means in a moment, unless you're going to be compensated for that, then you're not going to be able to enter that labour market or that industry or take that certain job within your same industry because even if it means you're going to be more productive and more useful, because physically getting to work creates a much larger opportunity cost. And then also you have some cultural impacts as well. Um, that might be to do with not wanting to work in certain industries because of culture. It might be to do with staying in a certain area because of culture. It might be to do with the idea of like not leaving your economy or not leaving your country. Or it might be to do with the idea that um, in certain cultures you might have to stay at home and like look after um, individuals within that kind of household, all of those things mean that you are not able to enter labour markets efficiently and you're kind of stuck. And then also we have like language barriers as well. Remember that that stops human capital being transferable because even though you might physically be able to do that job very well, I might be um, an economics teacher, but if I can't speak Mandarin, I'm going to really struggle to teach um, economics to the same level in certain parts of China that don't speak English because I am not able to transfer my skills to that market, even though I might be very good at teaching a certain area. So those things stop labour being able to be transferable from one area to another area, and that's geographical immobility of labour. And what that means is you become more, like the elasticity of supply is gonna become more inelastic. Because if you think about getting to and from work, if you have poor access to infrastructure or it costs you a lot to access the market, right? So say, for instance, you have good public transport, but the price of public transport is very high. So what that's going to do is your elasticity of supply is going to go from relatively um, elastic to 
very inelastic. Because essentially what you're saying is, is that it's going to cost you more to be able to enter the market, right? So you need to have a much larger increase in wage for it to be worthwhile for you to enter the market. So um, if you think about traveling to work, yes, a job might be really useful and you might be a really useful human um, unit of human capital to do that job, but actually the wage needs to increase by quite a lot for you to be able to give more hours or enter that market to extend the amount of supply in that market because it's costing you more to enter that market. So changing that elasticity supply, becoming more inelastic is market failure, right? It's labor market failure because that's not how it should be and it stops resources being able to access the markets. So obviously, um, you can have an effect on prices. This means that basically, if the cost of labor is higher, because labor is a drive demand, it just means that that's obviously gonna have a direct knock-on effect on the cost and the provision of goods and services. And if you really kind of think about that, it makes complete sense because labor is a cost of production. So if you want to increase your production or you need more um, human capital, because it's inelastic, you have to pay to get more, you need a more than proportional change in your price, in your wage level that you're offering, which is obviously gonna increase your cost, both your marginal cost and your average cost, which then is obviously gonna change your um, price, your profit maximizing position, which means you have to charge more. Um, okay, so one of the other things is housing and um, we're going to do a whole lesson on housing, so don't worry too much about housing. So the next one I want to talk about is economic inactivity. So economic inactivity is when an individual is inactive in the economy in the labour market, right? Now that doesn't mean that they're not um, doing stuff. Uh, we'll have a look kind of in a moment as to what I mean by that. And there is a huge area of study and a lot of criticism economically about kind of unpaid work and economic inactivity and inverted commas and what that kind of means. And we'll do a whole kind of lesson on that, but I will briefly touch on it now. So obviously staying in full-time education, though you might end up being um, more productive in the long run, that is sometimes often not true. And actually there's a lot of criticism about this idea that everybody going to university and expending, um, spending a long time in full-time education and actually the return on that um, kind of investment on time may not necessarily be um, economically impactful. Now obviously I know that that's so complicated because we might have a look at the actual impact on externalities and these things are really difficult to measure. So whilst we talk about economic um, kind of benefits, you might look at GDP growth for actually spending um, four or five years of your time. Additionally, studying a certain subject may not mean that you are earning more or you're more productive in the labour market, but equally you can balance that out and say that actually that might be better for society overall because education is going to reduce an externality. Um, obviously illness as well or disability, if you're not able to be um, economically active because you are not well, then that's going to have an impact on the labour market as well and that's technically labour market failure. You have human capital that is not able to access markets. Caring responsibilities. Now this is a super, super interesting one and it is something that we're going to have a look at in um, the kind of coming lessons. So caring responsibilities stop people being economically, um, economically active. However, it's very critical because what you're saying is, if you say, for instance, if you look at looking after somebody who's ill or looking after a child, if you pay somebody to do the exact same job, then they are economically active and you are economically active. But if you do that job, you are considered economically inactive, even though you're doing a job that you would necessarily pay somebody to do. So it's really complicated and there's a lot of criticism when it comes to this and the idea of kind of inverted commas of women's work. So women staying home to look after children um, and becoming economically inactive, but actually what they're doing is 
um, raising human capital, like future human capital, and if they paid somebody to do that, they would be considered economically active, despite actually there is an argument that raising children um, yourself and having that relationship might create a more sustainable unit of human capital. Obviously that might not necessarily be true, but it's super interesting. It's definitely something that we'll be looking at in the next couple of weeks when we look at discrimination in the labour market. So the other one is obviously discouraged workers, workers who have been discouraged from the labour market, who are just demotivated by the labour market. Um, there's also a lot of things that are coming out at the moment about graduates during the COVID crisis and how actually they're going to experience um, or they may experience some kind of discouragement um, entering into the labour market for the rest of their lives. And actually this idea of discouraged labour market workers is, um, is a really, really fascinating area for you to have a look at because what you end up with is if you look at kind of, there's some really interesting studies done about the idea of losing your job. So losing your job has a much, much, so the idea of being fired or being made redundant has a much bigger impact on discouraged workers than if you voluntarily leave your job, right? because it makes you feel jaded or it makes you feel less like you want to put effort into finding another job because you don't, you have issues with your own kind of self-esteem and those kind of psychological impacts have an impact on the um, economic uh, kind of labour market themselves. And the last one I'll talk about is wealth versus income. So we need income or we need some kind of like um, finan finances to be able to survive and live um, a basic standard of life or beyond in the economy. But actually that doesn't necessarily need the, mean that you need an income because there are different types of kind of ways to gain finances. And if you have a lot of wealth, you may not need to gain an income, right? So for instance, if you are in a partnership and one of your partners is earning a lot and you don't need to have two individuals working, then that means it's gonna to lead to some economic inactivity. And equally, if you have like, if you are a, um, have particularly wealthy parents or guardians and they pass away or they give, just give you a certain allowance that kind of acts as an income, then therefore you don't need to enter into the labour market and therefore you are economically inactive. So this kind of ties into the debate about how actually taxing those who are really, um, who are incredibly high earners may actually lead to more economic activity for everybody. And equally things like inheritance tax and things like that may actually be an economic um, inheritance, not inheritance tax, but inheritance might be an economic drain rather than any form of economic boost and therefore we should tax inheritance really highly to be able to um, solve some kind of of the market failure in the labour market. Um, so those are economic inactivity. So the last thing that I want us to have a look at is something that's called working poverty. Now obviously the aim of the labour market, of you entering the labour market, is so that you can earn a living to be able to participate in some leisure. Right? If you think about when we looked at the backwards bending labour supply curve or labour supply in general. But that's not always true. So and remember that market failure is when we look at what is beneficial for the overall society in general. It is not beneficial for the overall society in general for an individual to be working and still be in poverty. Like that is labour market failure. The market has absolutely failed if you are working a full time job and you are still in poverty. So we call that in economics like working poverty. So it's when a family, so this is kind of like the government's um, definition. So it's when a family with at least one person in paid work um, have a household income that keeps them beneath the official poverty line. So you are working and you are still um, in poverty, right? And it was found in 2019 that one in eight families, so like one in eight families and one in eight children um, were classed as working poor, right? So one in eight individuals in the UK, so one in eight families in the in the UK, not one in eight individuals, but one in eight families in the UK were classed as working poor. So they were, had a member of their family that was working, participating, economically active, and they were still living under the poverty line. Now, obviously that is absolutely labor market failure. 
And we need to start thinking about ways that the government can intervene to correct, to correct some of this labour market failure. So, um, thank you so much for watching. What we're going to do is you need to think about ways that we can correct this labour market failure. Next is we're going to have a look at discrimination in the labour market. Um, I hope it's been useful and I look forward to seeing you then. Bye!